Um, all right, let's, let's get started. Uh, the Secretary General is in Paris, where a few minutes ago he met with Emmanuel Macron, the President of France. They discussed the objectives of the Paris summit, including the importance of reforms to the international financial architecture, debt relief, access to liquidity, as well as the urgent need for climate action and climate justice. The Secretary General and the President also discussed the war in Ukraine, as well as the situation in the Sahel, the crisis in Sudan and its regional implications. Tomorrow morning, the Secretary General will deliver remarks at the opening ceremony of the Paris summit hosted, as you know, by President Macron. He will renew his appeal for ambitious reforms to the international financial architecture and will present his proposals, including an SDG stimulus, to better support developing and emerging economies and put us back on track to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. Later in the day, the Secretary General will go to, the, to Sciences Po University to take part in a discussion on the state of world affairs with students, alumni, and academics. As a reminder, both the summit's opening ceremony and the event at Sciences Po will be webcast live on UN Web TV. This morning, the Secretary General spoke in a video message to the Economic and Social Council Humanitarian Affairs segment. He emphasized the urgent and unprecedented global humanitarian needs, noting that 360 million people worldwide require assistance. This is a 30% increase from the previous year, with over 110 million forcibly displaced people and more than 260 million facing severe food insecurity. The Secretary General commended the efforts of humanitarian aid agencies in reaching more people and maximizing resources. But he underscored that there is a persistent funding crisis with only 20% of the required funds under the global humanitarian appeal having been received. The Secretary General called for discussions during the ECOSOC segment to address increasing humanitarian resources, enhancing the efficiency of aid delivery, protecting vulnerable individuals, especially women and girls, and addressing the root causes of conflict to reduce food insecurity and investing in climate adaptation to build resilience. This morning, the Security Council held a meeting on Afghanistan. Briefing Council members, the Special Representative of the Secretary General, Rosa Utunbaeva, said that the United Nations continues to face a complicated situation in Afghanistan. She noted that the April 5th restrictions against Afghan women working for the UN place a question mark over our activities across the country. Ms. Otunbaeva said that we will not put our national female staff in danger, and therefore we are asking them not to report to the office. At the same time, we have asked all our male national staff performing non-essential tasks to stay home to respect the principle of non-discrimination. Finally, she said, she said, we are steadfast. Female national staff will not be replaced by male national staff, as some de facto authorities have suggested. Ms. Otenbaeva also noted that UN cash shipments required for humanitarian operations are expected to decrease as donor funding declines, warning that this could begin having a negative effect on monetary stability. Ms. Otenbaeva said that in her regular discussions with the de facto authorities, she's blunt about the obstacles they have created for themselves by the decrees and restrictions they have enacted, in particular those against women and girls. She said that we have conveyed to them that as long as these decrees are in place, it is nearly impossible that their government will be recognized by members of the international community. Ms. Otenbaeva noted that based on our discussions with many interlocutors across the country, it is also clear that these decrees are highly unpopular among the Afghan population. She noted that they cost the Taliban both domestic and international legitimacy while inflicting suffering on their population and damaging their economy. Her remarks have been shared with you. The UN World Food Program Dir Deputy Executive Director and Chief Operating Officer Carl Scow yesterday finished a vi visit to Afghanistan where he saw firsthand WFP's operations in one of the world's largest humanitarian crises. He witnessed the impact of the latest restrictions on women's employment and of an acute funding crisis which recently forced WFP to cut rations and drastically reduce the number of people it serves with life-saving assistance. WFP notes that in Afghanistan, rations have had to be reduced for people even in the areas with the highest levels of food insecurity, and 8 million highly vulnerable people will no longer receive WFP's emergency assistance due to funding shortfalls. WFP urgently needs $918 million to maintain operations for the coming six months. Turning to Ukraine, the Undersecretary General and UN Development Program Administrator Akim Steiner in his capacity as the Vice Chair of the United Nations Sustainable Development Group, 
is in London, representing the Secretary General at the Ukraine Recovery Conference. In his remarks today, Mr. Steiner said that he had just returned from Ukraine, where the people he met with have had their lives and livelihoods shattered by war. He noted that the UN continues efforts to provide assistance to all of those in need, including in areas currently under Russian control, where humanitarian access is extremely limited. To chart a way forward, Mr. Steiner said that we, along with our partners, are also developing a damage assessment with a focus on agriculture and the environment. He said that in 2023, the UN scaled up its recovery efforts, implementing $1 billion of recovery and development programming in line with the government's priorities, driven by 24 UN entities and more than 3,700 personnel. Mr. Steiner highlighted that the UN's pledge to stay and deliver in Ukraine is characterized by community-level recovery. Jointly planning, sequencing, and layering our humanitarian development and social cohesion support. He said that we are connecting Ukrainians' resilience with the tools that people need today to invest and rebuild towards futures that are not defined by this war. The humanitarian coordinator in Ukraine, Denise Brown, is also attending the conference in London. Also on Ukraine, the World Food Program representative and country director and the senior humanitarian official currently on the ground, Matthew Hollingsworth, condemned an attack on Kherson yesterday that killed and injured rescue workers from the State of Emergency Service uh, of Ukraine. Mr. Hollingsworth recalled that this incident was yet another example of the human impact of Russia's invasion of Ukraine and reminded, about the ob reminded us about the obligations to protect civilians, including rescue workers under international humanitarian law. On the response front, we, along with our humanitarian partners, continue to work nonstop to assist people impacted by the devastation caused by the destruction of the Kokovka Dam, complementing the remarkable work being carried out by volunteers in addition to the government response. Two weeks since the disaster, UN agencies and humanitarian partners organized 12 interagency convoys, including two by boat and amphibious trucks, delivering 50 truckloads of vital supplies to help people in the Kherson region and those living in the Dnipro region, where access to drinking water is extremely limited due to the disaster. This is in addition to the assistance provided separately by UN agencies and NGOs. Overall and across all affected areas, the UN, along with our partners, delivered more than 2 million liters of water, 130,000 ready-to-eat food rations, hygiene items, medical supplies, shelter kits, sleeping bags, blankets, and other essential items. This is in addition to medical services, counseling, legal services, and cash assistance. Over 2 million people were also reached through mine awareness campaigns. And a statement we issued yesterday expressed the Secretary General's disappointment at the slowing pace of inspections and the exclusion of the port of Yuzhny Pivdeny from the Black Sea Initiative. This has resulted in a reduction in the movement of vessels coming in and out of Ukrainian seaports, leading to a drop in the supply of essential foodstuffs to global markets. Food exports through the Maritime Humanitarian Coordinate Corridor have dropped significantly from a peak of 4.2 million metric tons in October 2022 to 1.3 million metric tons in May, the lowest volume since the initiative began last year. The Secretary General calls on the parties to accelerate operations and urges them to do their utmost to ensure the continuation of this vital agreement, which is up for renewal on the 17th of July. The United Nations is fully committed to supporting the implementation of both the Black Sea Initiative and the Memorandum of Understanding on Russian Food and Fertilizer Exports so that exports of food and fertilizers, including ammonia, from the Russian Federation and Ukraine, reach markets around the world safely and predictably. This is especially critical now as the new grain harvest begins in both Ukraine and the Russian Federation. We have an update for you on our humanitarian operations in Sudan. Over the past four weeks, the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs has facilitated the movement of 438 trucks, carrying some 17,000 tons of aid to different parts of Sudan. 50 of those trucks moved during the first two days of the latest ceasefire. We will continue to deliver ceasefire or not, but we also continue to call for an end to the fighting so that we can reach all people in need in Sudan, wherever they are. Meanwhile, we are alarmed by the impact that attacks on health care are having on women and girls in the country. The World Health Organization and the UN Population Fund say that more than two-thirds of hospitals are closed in areas impacted by the fighting. Several maternity hospitals are also out of action. Of the more than 2.5 million women and girls of reproductive age in Sudan, nearly 263,000 are estimated to be pregnant. One-third of them will give birth in the next three months, and all of them need access to critical reproductive health services. 
As the fighting continues in Sudan, the number of people internally displaced by the violence has risen to nearly 2 million, according to the International Organization for Migration. The highest proportion of internally displaced persons have been observed in West Darfur, River Nile, White Nile, and northern states. And just to flag that yesterday afternoon, Nicholas Hasem, the Secretary General's Special Representative and Head of the United Nations Mission in South Sudan, briefed the Security Council on challenges impeding the peace process in the country. He stressed that the ongoing conflict in Sudan threatens South Sudan's political landscape, placing already fragile peace gains at risk by diverting attention at a critical phase of the country's democratic transition. Mr. Hasem urged South Sudanese leaders to harness political will to achieve constitutional and electoral benchmarks, which are 10 and 9 months delayed, respectively, as well as to create civic and political space for all citizens to participate in these nation-building processes. Today is the International Day of Yoga. In his message for the day, the Secretary General said that yoga unites body and mind, humanity and nature, and millions of people across the globe. It connects us to our planet, which so badly needs our protection. Today is also the International Day of the Celebration of the Solstice. The solstices, together with the equinoxes, are connected with seasons, harvests, and livelihood. That is it for me. Yes, Betul. Thanks. Uh, first on Ukraine uh, in this meeting in the UK. Um, Ukraine said that Russia must pay for what it destroyed. We are preparing a fair mechanism that will allow confiscation of up to $500 billion of Russian assets. Hidden in the West, does the SG believe that Russia should uh, pay for the recovery of Ukraine? This would be my first question. I think our priority is to finding a way to end this conflict in the first place. Once that's done, we'll see what can be done so that the international community as a whole uh, is able to help with, uh, with the recovery of Ukraine, which will uh, be needed in due course. But first, of course, we have to make sure that nothing further is destroyed, which means an end to the fighting. But does he believe that Russia should pay for the recovery? after um, the conflict comes I, to an end. I wouldn't have any comment on, on uh, what the officials at the London conference said. Uh, as, as I mentioned, uh, our uh, colleagues Denise Brown and Akam Steiner are there, and, uh, and uh, I would refer you to uh, the comments that they're making. Mr. Steiner's comments are available on the UNDP website now. And on, sorry, on Afghanistan, the SRSG also said that the special coordinator is currently in Afghanistan. Uh, after he completes his visit, who does he report to? Does he plan to give a briefing to the Security Council? What happens? And also, uh, there was a two-day meeting in Astana uh, in, on Syria. Uh, is the UN being represented? Uh, if yes, uh, who is there? Uh, can you also give us an update on that? Thanks. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, uh, regarding um, your question on Afghanistan, uh, yes, uh, he, uh, he, he will report back. Uh, we'll let you know once, uh, once there is any uh, report that he has to provide uh, to uh, the Security Council. Uh, but at this point, he is, he's going about his work. Uh, regarding um, the situation uh, in Astana, what I can tell you is uh, that Gare Peterson, the Special Envoy for Syria, attended the Astana format talks in Astana, uh, in his engagements with the Syrian government and opposition delegations and with the delegations of Iran, Russia, and Turkey, and also with observers, he stressed the need for all players to work together for a political solution in line with Security Council Resolution 2254. James? Yeah, um, let me start with um, the Secretary General's 2334 report to the Security Council, which Security Council members have now received. He talks about the, being particularly disturbed about the high levels of settler-related violence and reports of Israeli security forces standing by and not preventing settler attacks against Palestinians. Um, as you know, Israel has obligations as the occupying power. What, what is the Secretary General doing about this? What, what, what has he been saying to the Israelis? Who's he been speaking to? Uh, well, we've been speaking at various levels with our, uh, with our Israeli interlocutors to make them aware of what their responsibilities are. Uh, as the occupying power. And we are also, of course, in touch with uh, concerned nations, including, as you, as you just pointed out, the members of the Security Council, so that they're aware of this and of the need, uh, again, for Israel to uphold its uh, responsibilities. Uh, and another one um, on Myanmar. 
Uh, the UN Special Rapporteur, who I understand is entirely separate from the Secret uh, Secretariat, um, has said, though, that the ASEAN nations, following the meeting that took place in Thailand, should not be engaging with the junta in any way. He said it's the dangerous effect of legitimising the junta and undermining ASEAN unity. On this occasion, I know he's independent, but does, does the Secretary General agree with Mr Andrews? Uh, I, in this case, uh, I, well... You're quite right. Uh, the opinions of the human rights rapporteurs are their own as they are independent experts. Uh, from our standpoint, as you know, our, uh, our special representatives who have been dealing with Myanmar have been in contact with, uh, with the Association of Southeast Asian Nations and have tried to see what can be done so that they can play a productive role uh, without, uh, uh, in terms of their contacts without uh, uh, cre creating the possibility that the junta's uh, uh, rule is legitimized. Yeah, I mean, I, I understand that she works very closely with ASEAN, but ASEAN now seems to not be unified and have a unified position on this. So is the Secretary General's advice to ASEAN to engage or not to engage? We will leave the decisions on how ASEAN uh, deals with the junta up to the member states of ASEAN themselves, and we respect... Uh, their right uh, to, uh, to work collectively to find what the best solution is for relationships with, uh, with Myanmar. From our standpoint, we have never tried uh, to legitimize the rule of the junta, even though, as you're aware, we have also been in contact with the de facto authorities. Uh, Edie. Uh, thank you very much, Farhan. Um, uh, one follow-up on Myanmar. Um, is there any time frame for the Secretary General um, appointing a new special envoy for Myanmar? We're, we're trying to get this done as soon as possible. As you know, uh, Noeline Hazer's uh, time uh, has ended uh, as of uh, the last uh, couple of weeks. Right. Uh, and, uh, and we are looking to... Uh, uh, to find someone else as, as soon as we can. We'll let you know once, uh, once someone's named. And on the um, issue of envoys, can you tell us uh, what's happening with uh, Volker Perthes? Is the Secretary General planning to appoint another um, SRSG for Sudan? Uh, Mr. Perthes continues on the job. He is the head of UNITAMS. Uh, and, and there's been no change uh, to his status in that regard. Uh, yes, Pam. Thank you, Farhan. Uh, is there a UN position on the de facto authorities, Taliban authorities in Afghanistan with regard to what the Chinese ambassador mentioned on release of funds to the government, frozen funds by governments to, is, in this case, the United States to the government? Well, uh, I would just refer you to what Ms. Otunbaeva said. It's clear that some of the actions by the de facto authorities have made it harder for them uh, uh, in terms of their dealings with the overall international community. And, and this is one of the issues on which it's very clear that they need to be aware of, of, of the need to change uh, the, uh, to change their policies uh, so that uh, they have a better relationship with the international community overall. Uh, Pam. Uh, sorry. I meant Linda. I just, I was looking at you still. Linda. Thank you, Farhan. Going back to Afghanistan, um, would you have any more facts and figures about, in reference to the uh, women being banned from working? Um, would you have any figures in terms of the numbers of essential male workers versus non-essential, just to get a sense of how many people are actually working? Uh, we'll, we'll try to get some, some facts and figures for you on that. Uh, I, I, I believe the overall figures for UNAMA are available on the UNAMA website. Um, yes, Ephraim. Thanks, Farhan. On Afghanistan as well, this message um, from the UN that the Taliban need to be, uh, need to, um, uh, change their behavior basically to get the recognition of the international community. It hasn't worked despite all the high level uh, action on that uh, level. 
um, there are some calls, there have been some calls recently uh, for some sort of engagement or recognition of the Taliban in order for the international community to have more levers uh, with the Taliban. Is, there, is this uh, kind of thinking also um, uh, happening here at the UN? Is there some change as to how I, to engage? I think the thinking at the UN was what was described in the Security Council today by Rosa Utenbaeva. So I would just refer you to what she said uh, there. Uh, Alan. Thank you very much, uh, Farhan. I have a question regarding the uh, Green Deal. Uh, several media outlets uh, recently um, uh, made a publications claiming that uh, the Black Sea Initiative uh, is um, commercial but not humanitarian. We all remember how a year ago uh, it was aimed to fight the hunger in Africa especially, and even Martin Griffiths was mentioning that the first vessel should go to uh, Somalia, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. So my question is simple, it's, it's to you. Uh, do you consider the uh, Black Sea Initiative as a commercial or humanitarian initiative? Thank you. The fundamental purpose of the Black Sea Initiative is a humanitarian purpose. It's true that quite a lot of grain transactions are commercial transactions, but those commercial transactions help our humanitarian goal by maintaining uh, a lower level of world food prices overall, and particularly a lower level of, of crucial grain prices, which are fundamental uh, to the economic uh, stability of many nations around the world. So uh, yes, it's, it's primarily uh, a humanitarian effort even uh, even insofar as it uh, deals with commercial transactions. Uh, Deji. Uh, two questions. First, a follow-up of Pam's question on the frozen assets in, uh, for Afghanistan. Um, from your answer, is it, is it correct for me to understand for the United Nations, uh, the, the issue of frozen assets as development, uh, the development uh, assets is actually interconnected with the human rights issues and other issues. Is that correct? No, what I'm really suggesting is that these are decisions. The decision to share, give funds to the de facto authorities or not to give them are decisions that are being taken by member state governments. That, that's their prerogative. What I'm suggesting, and this is something that uh, Ms. Otenbaeva has made clear in her recent briefings, is that the sense of security that member state governments have with the de facto authorities in Afghanistan is affected by the policies of the Taliban itself. So theoretically speaking, these funds should be released to Afghanistan, but according, uh, but due to many other unexpected uh, factors that they cannot really do this. At the end of the day, um, we understand that different states do not know whether uh, it is a wise thing to do to free up money to the de facto authorities as it stands. They need a gra greater sense of security about uh, whether that is the right thing to do, and that is something that is in turn affected by the, the de facto authorities' own policies. So it's still interconnected. Anyway, my question, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, just to follow up on, on James' question on, on, on the West back on uh, the West Bank, the, the Israeli government today makes a joint statement said that the government will advance planning about a thousand housing units in the West Bank settlements. Any comments from the UN on this decision? Well, you, you saw what our statement was on this. Uh, the Secretary General made clear in, in our statement our concerns about this. And, uh, and again, we restated that uh, from our standpoint the settlements have no legal validity. Uh, so I, I just uh, refer you to the full statement that we issued uh, two days ago. Uh, before we go to round two, let's finish up on round one. First, uh, first Celia. Farhan, maybe I did not hear what you said about the question uh, James asked you on uh, Israel-Palestine. Did you use the terms uh, occupying power when it comes to Israel? And if so, yes. yes, I did. If you recognize that it's an occupying power, why is the UN not being more strict about it? 
I, I would just refer you to the history of the UN involvement on this issue. We've been very clear about the need to end the occupation. We've been very clear about our support for a two-state solution that has as its ultimate goal the establishment of two states, Israel and Palestine, living side by side in peace and security. Um, Stefano and then Joe Klein and then we'll go back. Oh, wait, have you had a question? Uh, Stefano and then you and then Joe Klein. All right, Stefano. Thank you, Farhan. It's about the submarine search. Uh, now there is also France uh, searching for this uh, submarine. We all hope that they, they can, that five people can be rescued. But I have this question. Uh, does the Secretary General wish that uh, when 500 or more than 500 migrants are strained in the water, the same kind of rescue he's done before they die? We, we want all people whose lives are at risk at sea to be, uh, to be rescued, obviously. That's, that's very clear. Uh, at the same time, of course, uh, we are as aware of these latest news reports as you are, and we hope uh, that, uh, that all of those people who are in this current situation will, uh, will be able uh, to return to surface safely. Uh, Yvonne? Thanks, Farhan. My question is also on Afghanistan. Listening to the briefing this morning, uh, the UN operation in Afghanistan has been hobbled effectively by the Taliban's policies. Women can't even go to work. UN staff can't go to work. So how long is the UN willing to put up with this situation for? Uh, at this stage, the point is that we have not, even under very trying circumstances over the past decades, ever abandoned the people of Afghanistan. We're trying to do our best, even under these circumstances, as dire as they are, uh, to provide support to the Afghan people. And, uh, and we will see, and, and we continue to call, as, as we did again today, for the de facto authorities to end this uh, discriminatory regime. But are you working on a contingency because they are not changing their position, don't seem likely to change their position? We are evaluating uh, the situation as, as it pro progresses. I, I have no change in the situation to report. Uh, Joe Klein. Yes, uh, with all of the uh, critical statements um, that the uh, UN has put out about Israeli policies, I'm wondering, and I apologize if this has been done, but I haven't seen it. I'm wondering whether the Secretary General has any comment on the uh, killing of four Israeli civilians yesterday by two Palestinian gunmen for which Hamas has taken credit. Uh, yes, the Secretary General shares the sentiments of uh, Tor Venisland, who strongly condemned uh, this killing. Uh, I would refer you to what M Mr. Venisland said. Uh, we'll see whether there's any further statement uh, down the line on this. Uh, Iftikhar. Uh, thank you, Farhan. My question on Afghanistan has been asked. Thank you. I, I love moments like that. Uh, James. <laughs> a, couple more a couple more questions, Farhan. Uh, first concerns the two most powerful men in the world. President Biden says President Xi is a dictator. Does the Secretary General agree? Uh, I, I'm not <laughs> going to comment on, on the uh, the 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 rhetoric of, of any of the leaders. Uh, obviously, what we want to see is a strong and positive relationship between uh, the People's Republic of, of China and the United States of America. So does he find comments like that un unhelpful to, 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 to getting that? Well, that would entail me commenting on the, 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 the comments that have been made. <laughs> one, one other question, if I may. Um, the SRSG, SRSG Otumbeeva, has come all the way from Kabul. I assume flying from Kabul to Dubai and then to New York. Long journey. We don't get to see her very often. She spoke in the Security Council. There doesn't seem to be any sign of a stakeout from her. Um, and I, I would have thought senior UN officials, part of their job is public diplomacy. And I, I know I bang on about this yeah. all the time, but why are we not getting a stakeout? Don't tell me she's too busy to give us 10 minutes. Uh, I, we're, we're, we're doing our best to try to see what information we can provide from our uh, UNAMA team for you. And, 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 and then to, to add to that, tomorrow we have the executive director of the World Food Programme in the building, Cindy McCain. Is she going to be doing a stakeout for us? Uh, we, we will see whether there's going to be anything by uh, Ms. McCain. I'm, I'm not aware of a stakeout at this, at this point. 
C can we please implore you that we'll, you know we'll, we'll to do our in, jobs we need to speak to these people we'll we'll be in Thank touch you. with our world food program colleagues Thank you uh, yes Edie. let me first echo what James said um, I'm sure everyone here would uh, like to get a chance to question both Miss Otonbaeva and Cindy McCain um, has the Secretary General gotten any reaction to his statement about the slowdown in Black Sea grain shipments? Um, and what is the UN doing to try to uh, speed these up and get them back to a more productive level? Well, at the operational level, our colleagues at the Joint Coordination Center in Istanbul are working uh, with the various parties, which is to say Russia, Ukraine, and Turkey, to do what we can uh, to see how inspection activity can be sp sped up. Uh, but the Secretary General is calling on the parties themselves to do what they can to move forwards, including uh, by also allowing uh, activity once more at the port of Yuzhny Pivdenye. Is the S Secretary General prepared to state which of the parties is responsible for this slowdown? Uh, I would just refer you to the text of his statement, which says it as clearly as he can. But also, if you looked uh, at the website of the Joint Coordination Center, they have been making clear uh, some of the delays and the causes of them. And uh, Dulcie, and then we'll uh, turn yeah. to uh, Paulina after that. I, I just wanted to ask you about that uh, third port uh, in the Black Sea Grain deal. What What is it about that port that's causing uh, the Russians not to allow grain to be exported? Thanks. Uh, I, I don't uh, speak for the Russian Federation, so you'd need to check with them what, what their concerns are. Well, I'm are. asking you because you're talking about the grain deal, so you must know what's going uh, on. I, I don't speak for the parties, though. Well, I'm asking the UN what it thinks is going but on. But you, you're, you, as a reporter, are also capable of asking the member states. Uh, yes. Uh, but you're Alan. not answering my question. Yes, because I don't speak for spe separate member but states. But I'm asking you to speak for the UN. Uh, it's very bizarrely circular, but uh, the fact is <laughs> different member states speak for their own reasons. Yes. Thank you, Farhan. I have a short uh, follow-up. Uh, uh, is the UN making any preparations for July 19th when the grain deal expires, if Russia stops it? Uh, what we are preparing for is to s see everything that can be done to extend both the Memorandum of Understanding with the Russian Federation and the Black Sea Initiative. And so that is where we are channeling all our efforts. Paulina Kubiak, it's your turn.